Hello, good evening. I'm Elise Carter Vosen, director of the Oric Alpern Interreligious Forum, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the opening lecture of this year's series on art interpretation and performance of sacred texts. We're honored to welcome St. Scholastica and UMD administrators, faculty, staff, and students, and it's especially wonderful to see so many students here tonight, as well as members of a number of religious communities from across our region. Our aim is to build relationships among people from a broad range of perspectives, which will in turn promote understanding, respect, and peace among the diverse religious communities of our region, and to support public dialogue on religion and culture. To that end, I would like to mention our small interfaith study groups in the community, which are listed on the salmon-colored flyer that many of you picked up on the table just outside the door. Um, some of our current groups include Introduction to Buddhism, Religion and Science in Dialogue, and Daughters of Abraham, which is open to women of Jewish, Muslim, and Christian communities, and it will be featured in next month's edition of The Woman Today. Um, we are holding three public events on sacred texts this year to which I would like to draw your attention, and I'll begin with those in the spring. At the end of March and early April, um, we're excited to host as artists in residence Torah scribe Julie Seltzer from San Francisco and Islamic calligrapher Thea Fenjan from Dearborn, Michigan. Um, each artist will hold workshops, demonstrate their work, answer questions, and give a public talk. And our last event in the series is entitled After the Book, a talk by Columbia professor Mark Taylor, which considers what happens to sacred text and religious community in this postmodern era. That talk will be on April 17th. And finally, but most importantly, in three weeks, we will host a follow-up event to this one entitled Ancient Texts, Modern Life. On the table as you leave, if you haven't picked it up already, you'll find a white handout which includes the specific passages of sacred text and the discussion questions which will, will guide a conversation that we'll be having with Rabbi David Steinberg, who is the new rabbi of Temple Israel, Pastor Lon Weaver of Glen Avon Presbyterian Church, and Kashif Soroya of the Islamic Resource Group of the Twin Cities. Each one will chant, recite, read, interpret, and facilitate discussion um, about what these texts mean to our own Jewish, Christian, and Muslim communities. So I hope you'll, you'll join us for that rewarding conversation on Thursday, November 4th. Tonight's presentation lays essential groundwork for that discussion. In my mind, the title, Scriptures in Three Dimensions, can be read two different ways. Three facets of the Abrahamic family, whose sacred texts will be considered tonight, and the three-dimensional, vibrant ways in which the people of each community interact with these texts. Um, I'd like to take just a moment to thank all the people who made this talk possible. Um, the members of the Oric Alpern Interreligious Forum Board, the members of the Mitchell Auditorium staff, um, the members of the conferencing department, and um, the School of Arts and Letters, who is always very supportive, as well as the president's staff. Um, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Dr. James Watts received a Master of Divinity and Master of Theology degrees at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky and then went to Yale University where he earned a PhD in Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. He specializes in literature and religion of the Hebrew Bible, biblical Hebrew, ancient religious rhetoric, law and narrative genres, iconic books, and theories of scriptures. He has taught at Syracuse University since 1999 where he's professor and chair of the Department of Religion. A broad range of subject matter in his courses includes Torah, New Testament, Jesus in History and Tradition, seminars on sacrifice, death and afterlife, purity and pollution and ritual theory, religions and literatures of ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, Ugarit and Israel, including Second Temple Judaism, and women in biblical tradition. Dr. Watts is the author of Psalm and Story, Inset Hymns in Hebrew Narrative, Reading Law, The Rhetorical Shaping of the Pentateuch, and Ritual and Rhetoric in Leviticus, From Sacrifice to Scripture. He is currently working on a textbook entitled The Pentateuch, Introduction to the Torah as a Scripture. Dr. Watts just recently organized the third annual interdisciplinary symposium on iconic books, which took place earlier this month, bringing together scholars from a variety of disciplinary backgrounds and cultural perspectives 
from anthropology, sociology, history and religious studies to library science, and from the ancient Near East to contemporary Korea. The conference was organized around three large themes, the book, the concept of iconicity, and the uses of scriptures. Tonight, Dr. Watts will address these three themes as he considers the formation, interpretation, study, and performance of sacred texts in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. We're so pleased to have Dr. Jim Watts with us, a multidimensional person who has the ability to take on these scriptural traditions of the three Abrahamic uh, religions, no small task, I would add, the formation of their major sacred texts, their interpretation, their iconicity and artistry, and the chanting, recitation, preaching, study, debate, and ritual which allow them to live in community. I'd like to please ask you to wel uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Watts. Good evening. Thank you, Professor Carter Bosen, for that very generous um, introduction and for the invitation to be here tonight with all of you. When I heard from her, her initial invitation to come here and heard about the um, series on the scriptures of the three traditions um, and the invitation to come and introduce uh, the series tonight, I thought, what a wonderful idea, what a wonderful thing to do for a community, and uh, what a wonderful invitation to be able to come and be a part of it. And so I gladly said yes. When I then actually started getting ready for tonight, <laughs> I thought, am I insane? <laughs> I said, the scriptures of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam no limits in time, space, place, culture, nationality, language. Each of these traditions, thousands of years old, multifaceted in its scope across the various countries and languages and regions of the world. Each tradition rich in the ways in which it has in the past and today appropriates its scriptures. And I'm supposed to talk about all of this in, what, 45, 50 minutes? I don't know who could do this, but I'll have to disagree with Professor Carter Bozen. I know I am not the expert who can do all of that, not even in 50 hours. Right. Let me tell you a little bit about more about who I am, and then I'll talk a little bit about what I think maybe I can do here tonight. I am a uh, Christian by upbringing and by current practice of that peculiar sect known as Presbyterians. Um, I am trained in especially Hebrew Bible studies, especially the Pentateuch, the Torah. I spend a lot of time with the book of Leviticus, which is by many people considered one of the odder books of the Hebrew Bible. Um, However, in recent years, I have also increasingly been engaging through my teaching and increasingly with interdisciplinary study with other scholars in the comparative study of scriptures. Why do I do that? Well, for me, it's a lot like the reason that I like to travel abroad, which I try to do every time I get an opportunity to do it. It's a wonderful thing to go and see new places engage in cultures that I haven't engaged before, meet new people, learn much more about the world in which I live, even though I realize if I travel for only a few days or weeks or even months, I've only barely touched the surface of the places I've been to. That's a wonderful thing. But I truly think one of its greatest values is what happens to me when I come back home. And when I come back to my own city, in my own neighborhood, my own house, for about a week or two, I see them a little bit differently. The, 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 the lens has shifted. And I can see them with somewhat foreign eyes. And I see things that I somehow never noticed before, and things that I look at every day, I somehow see from a little bit different light. And my study of comparative scriptures, my study of um, the scriptures of Islam, of Buddhism, Hinduism, and others, even as shallow as it has been, 
has begun to change the way I look at the scriptures I spend my life studying of the Torah uh, that is revered by Jews and Christians. I hope that this experience, not just tonight, but through this year, as you encounter each other and each other's experiences with scriptures in your various communities, I hope that, yes, you will learn about each other, you will learn about the ways in which various people in various traditions use their scriptures, but I hope also that you will find that added benefit on the top of being able to come back to your own tradition, your own scriptures, and suddenly see them a little bit differently, see things maybe you did not see before, and um, gain a little bit of insight into things that had seemed very familiar. What I want to do tonight is simply this. I want to start with the basics, the absolute basics, and I, I uh, appeal for your, um, your patience, those of you who already know all of this, and I'm sure there are many of you. Um, I've been teaching undergraduates for 20 years now, and I try not to assume anything. So we're going to start with the basics. Um, but then I would like to just suggest a way in which one can go forward in a discussion of, uh, of comparing experience of scriptures in various traditions. But let me begin um, with a ba very basic description of the scriptures of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The Jewish Bible consists of three parts. I told you this would be basic. Uh, the first part is the Torah, uh, usually translated law or instruction. This is the first five books of both the Jewish and the Christian Bible, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It contains a great deal of instructions and laws and uh, ritual affairs, ethics, um, legal issues, but about half of the contents are stories, narratives, very famous stories creation of the world, the stories of Abraham, Isaac, Sarah, Ishmael, the stories of Israel's exodus from Egypt. The second section of the Jewish Bible consists of Nevi'im, the prophets, um, which contains four large books of prophetic oracles, revelations of God to prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. It also contains four books of stories or history, the history of the people of Israel in the land and especially of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. The final section consists of the Ketuvim, which means writings, and you might guess from that label that this is a sort of a miscellaneous category. It includes books, uh, more books of uh, history and narrative. It includes books of poetry like Psalms, uh, Song of Songs. Uh, it includes books of wisdom um, and uh, 11 books in all. And this creates the 24 books of the Jewish Bible, usually familiarly known uh, among other names as the Tanakh, which is an acronym TNK for the three divisions of the scriptures. Okay. The Christian Bible. We're going to move fast tonight. <laughs> Um, the Christian Bible, and, and this is fairly unusual among the world's religions, I'll have to say, I, I, there are not many other instances where two major religious traditions claims the same material as scripture. But the Christian Bible, most of it consists of the Jewish Bible. Um, Christians call it the Old Testament, and for Protestants, the Old Testament is exactly the contents of the Jewish Bible, except in a somewhat different arrangement. For Catholics and Eastern Orthodox Christians, there's a bit more to the Old Testament. Other ancient Jewish books that were accepted as scripture within um, ancient Christianity, but were not accepted as scripture by the Jewish rabbis in antiquity. So um, the Christian, Christians don't quite agree on the contents of their canon entirely. Um, I, I should stop at this point because already we trip across one problem for interreligious dialogue, which is the problem of what to call this material that both Jews and Christians claim as part of their own scriptures. Um, for Jews, Bible or Tanakh is sufficient. Uh, that won't quite do for Christians because there's more to it than that. Um, Old Testament, however, implies there's a New Testament, which is, of course, not accepted by Jews. Um, so already we have terminological um, difficulties. Um, 
in academics, increasingly among scholars, um, we use the term Hebrew Bible or Hebrew scriptures, which is a bit redundant for Jews, um, and Christians don't read it in Hebrew, but nevertheless, we call it Hebrew Bible <laughs> in order to refer to this material um, that we study together. So when you hear me use that term or others, that's what we're referring to is the scriptures that both traditions hold in common. Of course, the Christian Bible also contains uh, uniquely Christian materials. Um, the, the New Testament, consisting of stories, um, the Gospels and Acts, um, letters by uh, apostles such as Paul and others, and a apocalyptic vision at the end, the famous book of Revelation, which accounts for about a quarter of the entire Christian Bible. All right. The Muslim scripture is called the Quran. It consists of the revelations of God through the uh, angel Gabriel, according to the tradition, to the prophet Muhammad. Muhammad received these orally. He heard them. He repeated them to his companions and followers. They then proceeded to write them down piecemeal, according to the tradition, later on not much later on, a little bit later, a few years later on, these were after Muhammad's death, these were then gathered together um, in order to create the uh, book, the Quran, as we have it. I, I emphasize that story of reception partly to say that the contents of the Quran in that sense are most like in the Jewish Christian Bible, the, excuse me, the prophetic books or the Torah, which is the speech of God to a prophet. Um, but I also emphasize it because it's fairly clear that in Muslim tradition, the emphasis in the Quran is very much on the hearing and then the repeating the recitation of the words. Um, this is a difference um, that isn't an absolute difference in Christian and Jewish tradition. It is also the case that the hearing of the scriptures, their reading is a central part of worship, and they are received that way. Nevertheless, I think it's um, pretty obvious to, to most people that um, in Muslim tradition, this receives much more emphasis, and the, and the emphasis really falls on hearing, recitation, re repeat, and repetition, and the word Quran itself means the reading or the recitation. Nevertheless, the outcome, of course, is a volume, a book, um, which consists of 114 surahs. Um, you can roughly translate that as somewhat like chapters in English. Um, the surahs, however, have been arranged um, after the first one, which is a prayer and a blessing. They're arranged roughly in order of size from longest to shortest uh, throughout the Quran. Now, as soon as I say, okay, these are the scriptures of these three traditions, I have to qualify this because there are other texts, there are other books in each tradition which have served um, as authoritative lenses or secondary interpretations um, through which the scriptures have been received in these traditions. In Islam, this is the hadith the collection of stories about the prophet Muhammad. Um, remember I said the Quran consists of God's words to Muhammad, um, very little or no stories or narratives involved. The Hadith make up for that by telling about Muhammad, about how he lived, how he himself lived out the divine word, how he applied it in his own life and his own situation. As a result, um, in many Muslim communities, the Hadith serve as a fairly authoritative basis for understanding how should one apply the teachings of the Quran to one's own situation or life. Um, so it's not Quran, but it's a secondary and very important uh, level of um, text through which um, Muslim life is interpreted and applied. In Judaism, there are a number of secondary um, texts which have um, authoritative, perhaps even sacred status. Um, the, uh, of which the most important are clearly the two Talmuds, the Babylonian Talmud and the Talmud of Israel, which are large collections of primarily of legal and ritual interpretive materials compiled by the libra excuse me, by the ancient rabbis, said to reflect the oral Torah or the oral teachings from the time of Moses on. 
Also um, uh, playing a major role in Jewish tradition are the various midrashim, the collections of illustrative stories told by the rabbis in order to um, apply the teachings of Torah, apply the teachings of the Talmud to the daily life of Jews. And, and I realized just looking at this, I've left out the Maksor, the prayer book um, which, uh, the, the, um, from which the prayers come, which also tends to have the status of a sacred text within many Jewish communities and should be on this list as well. I left Christians for last this time because Christians can't agree about this stuff. Uh, <laughs> um, in Christian tradition there are also secondary texts, but one of the things that tends to differentiate Christian denominations from each other is a lack of agreement over what they are. Perhaps the most agreement has to do with the ancient creeds. These are short statements of belief and doctrine formulated by the ecumenical councils in late antiquity and the early Middle Ages, of which the most famous and most often used are the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed. For some Christian communities, canon law, as developed in the Middle Ages, has played an authoritative role in, um, in applying the, um, the ways in which the, the faith is to be lived out, uh, and especially uh, addressing legal issues. We could also add missals and various other kinds of ritual books, in some communities, various kinds of prayer books that have the status of, as it were, a kind of secondary sacred text. Now, I have to stop right at this point because my guess is that already, just in trying to lay out what I have called the basics, I have already caused some people in this audience a fair amount of unease because I have been laying next to each other three scriptures from three traditions. In each tradition, there are large numbers of people who say what makes this scripture for me is that it's incomparable. There's nothing else like it. You can't do this, right? What makes for Muslims the Quran. <laughs> Keep my hands down, sorry. That was not thunder. <laughs> what makes the Quran Quran for Muslims? What makes Torah Torah for Jews? What makes the Bible the Bible for Christians is exactly that it isn't like anything else. It's God's word to us, right? So to lay them out next to each other already, we have a problem. <laughs> I, I've, I've, uh, now, there's an academic or, or intellectual version of this problem, which has to do with the definition of the word scripture. I've just been using the word. But in fact, the, the, it's one of these words that the more you study it, the harder it is to define. And you've already seen the variety, just in these three traditions, of the kinds of material that can be found in what we call scriptures. If we were to extend our survey to include Hindu and Buddhist and Sikh and Jain and, and so on, indigenous traditions, right, um, that variety becomes so broad as to wonder, are we talking about the same thing at all anymore? Um, so what I would like to do is suggest a way forward for our discussions tonight and perhaps also for your discussions over this year, um, which focuses not on beliefs about the books or beliefs about scriptures or doctrines about them, but focuses instead on what people are doing with them. How are the, how are the scriptures used by communities of faith, um, by congregations, by individuals um, to work out their um, religious devotion uh, and piety. And in other words, I want to suggest a kind of functional def description of scriptures. And, and I want to do this in terms of the word ritual. I want to uh, talk about scriptures as ritualized texts. Now, I realize by using that word, I also run into problems because in many people's minds, the word ritual also has a negative connotation. Uh, we, we have this phrase in English, right? Well, there's true belief and then there's empty ritual. There's a long religious history, mostly inside Christianity itself over this debate. It goes back at least 2,000 years. Um, 
I'm, all I want to say tonight is I'm not using it that way. By, by ritual, I'm just referring to various ways in which we human beings have of engaging each other in patterns of behavior that are usually intended basically to draw attention to specific occasions or specific things or specific people as special, as important, as significant in a certain way. Um, my suggestion to you is that religious traditions, those that have scriptures, call attention to books as scriptures by ritualizing them, and that they do it in um, three, at least three different, broadly different ways. Um, religious traditions ritualize their scriptures by talking about how they should be interpreted and, their, and, and giving traditions of interpretation, styles of interpretation, and so on. They also tend to draw attention to, uh, to the scriptures by giving instructions or models as to how the scriptures should be read out loud, even performed, also silently to oneself. And they also tend to have patterns of use in how the scriptures, the physical book itself, is to be handled, how it is to, um, to be um, displayed as an object, um, how it is to be seen um, as, a, as a visual image. In other words, I'm suggesting to you that there are three functional dimensions to scriptures that have to do with their ritualization along each of these three dimensions. The dimension I call the semantic dimension is the dimension of interpretation. It has to do with what the words in the scriptures mean and then how you apply them, what you do with them. There's the performative dimension that has to do with the way in which the scripture is first of all read, read aloud, performed, and so on. And then there's what I call the iconic dimension, which has to do with the material object itself and the image of the material object, the way it is displayed. Um, by the way, I very much appreciate the fact that my podium tonight has the seal of St. Scholastica on it and an iconic book right there. <laughs> Books are displayed as symbols, as images, and, um, and there's one. And, and, and religious traditions display books uh, um, and manipulate them um, in order to ritualize this dimension of their, of their um, scriptures. Let, let me give you specific examples um, of each one of these to give you a better idea of what I'm talking about. We'll start with the semantic dimension because that's the one that everybody pays all their attention to. What does it mean? How do we interpret it? How do we apply it? This is where we spend most of our time as scholars um, as historians, as believers, um, in talking about our scriptures. The Muslim, the Christian, and the Jewish traditions are notable, not unique, but notable for the fact that from their origins, at least close to their origins, they have privileged learning, especially learning of the scriptures, interpretation of the scriptures. In each tradition, scholars have a place of privilege and prestige to the point where I don't think it's an exaggeration that one of the characteristics of these traditions, not always, not everywhere, but most of the time, <laughs> is that religious authority is largely wielded by scholars, by those who know the scriptures best, can interpret them, can persuasively apply them. Um, your, uh, the leader of your congregation is expected to understand the scriptures, read the languages, um, be able to interpret them to others, and the leaders um, of the tradition broad, more broadly tend to also to be marked by their scholarship. There are exceptions to this, I, I realize, but, but by and large, each of these traditions is, uh, emphasizes learning and the um, instruction given to children and on up through the educational system. As a result, each of the traditions, and both of these examples are from Jewish tradition. I could come up with examples from Christian Muslim as well. But, um, but both of the, all these traditions, therefore, tend to produce um, various kinds of aids for interpreting the scriptures. Here I've just got a page, uh, two pages of Talmud that show the, the levels of the text, the Mishnah and the Gemara. Uh, often it's more elaborate than that. And, and you get these multi-leveled uh, texts. Um, 
uh, we think we invented hypertext in the last 20 years that's nothing like, uh, like this kind of scriptural commentary that will just build and build. And in each tradition has produced texts like this. They, it has also been uh, the case that each tradition has therefore produced large masses of scholarship and commentary, which seems to just keep growing over the centuries more and more. Uh, two examples here um, in the upper right-hand corner, a uh, medieval commentary on the Hadith, uh, just recently reprinted. In the bottom corner, some of you will recognize a large uh, commentary series on the, uh, on the Christian Bible. Um, and, and this is just a sample of the masses of scholarship, which I'm sure fill the library of St. Scholastica, fill libraries around the world, that each tradition has generated um, about its scriptures. And, and this keeps going on and on. I myself am writing a commentary. So you see, it, it just, just never ends. Um, that's the semantic dimension. The performative dimension has to do, first of all, with the way the text is read. And again, in each tradition, the reading, the, the public reading of the scriptures or their recitation from memory plays a role in worship, plays a significant uh, impact in the culture, and each tradition has developed various modes and practices and ways in which it is supposed to be read, recited, sung, um, and performed in other ways. Um, uh, just, uh, I think the pictures here are self-explanatory. One could multiply these many times. I would argue, though, the performative dimension has two aspects to it. There's a, all of these point to the words themselves and the way the words are performed. One can also perform the contents of the scriptures, especially the narrative sections of scriptures. Um, and as a result, especially in, um, well, in all three traditions, but I think particularly notable in Christian tradition has been the tendency to perform the scripture in theater, more recently in film, and especially in art, to depict the contents of the scenes um, in various modes of art. And I would classify these also as being within the performative dimension, focusing not on the words, but on the, on the stories, the contents within the words. Um, it may well, this is probably too radical a thesis, but I'd throw it out. Uh, Christians have tended to focus on narrative particularly. There's a fair amount of it in our Bible. Um, narratives are much easier to play out in theater. And <laughs> um, uh, uh, scriptures which focus on the words of God, uh, you can repeat the words. It's harder to know how you theatrically enact those. But uh, that, uh, it, it can be done, but nevertheless, um, I think the theatrical element has been particularly strong in um, Christian tradition, also in Hindu tradition, by the way, in which um, the performance of the Ramayana, um, other epics and the like, has played a very big role. My third dimension is the iconic dimension. This, I think, has received the least attention from um, scholars uh, and from the public. It's one of the things I've been trying to um, give greater research to, so I'm gonna give a few more examples just to show you what I have in mind. Um, the most obvious ritual, this uh, use of the physical text, is its display within rituals. Um, so, for example, the Torah scroll is often paraded through the congregation in a service. Um, here a picture for the celebration of Simchat Torah where there is dancing, uh, can be dancing as well as the, as the Torah scroll is paraded through the streets. In many liturgical Christian traditions, the uh, gospel book is processed in at the beginning of the service, held high by a priest or an acolyte as here. I honestly don't know of an equivalent to this in Muslim tradition. If anyone knows one, I'd love to hear about it afterwards. Um, uh, 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 my impression is that the, that the physical display of the book in worship is not generally a typical feature of Muslim practice. However, at least in recent years, in both Christian American cultures and in a number of Muslim cultures, the display of the scripture, the Bible or the Quran, appears frequently in public um, group, uh, either celebrations or protests. 
The example I have here is a, pic a picture from the news media of the release of prisoners who are being greeted back to their community. You'll see the individual in the, first, in the front celebrating their return with an upheld Quran. Um, there have been protests and meetings in this country where you will see people with their Bibles um, usually closed for some reason, but, but held up high um, and, and, and several things. So, so the, the physical book is used as a way of displaying thanks or displaying um, an appeal to God's will. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how we want to interpret it, but it's certainly become a feature of, um, of the uh, use of scriptures in recent years. Again, I don't know how far back I can trace that. Other iconic uses of the, of the scriptures include the, uh, the depiction of the script itself of the scriptures. And here I think Arabic calligraphy um, is the most prominent example. The way, uh, this is actually a blessing in the name of Allah, um, which has been done in gold as a hanging to appear on the wall of a house. Um, it's very common to see verses from the Quran um, hanging in homes, on buildings, especially mosques, um, uh, and other places. And the Arabic script itself is identified um, strongly with, um, with the scriptures. Of course, it's not unique to the scriptures, but nevertheless, that, that identification um, is found broadly uh, among many Muslim peoples. Um, one also sees often the, the shape of the book itself displayed, as on the seal on the front of this podium, to represent the scriptures. Um, so for, uh, in many graveyards, I've run across uh, monuments that will show uh, in stone, or as in this case in bronze, a book uh, uh, with uh, scriptures written on it. I think the most um, stunning example I have a picture of, I haven't had an opportunity to see it, is this one, which is a monument of the Quran in Sharjah and the United Arab Emirates, where it sits in the plaza immediately in front of the emir's palace. Um, uh, um, but this kind of, the monumental display of the scripture is, is something one can see fairly frequently um, uh, in this uh, iconic use. Finally, and most obviously, I just have to say the books themselves often get portrayed in elaborate form. And here, um, I could have come up with modern examples, but the medieval manuscripts from all three traditions are often stunning. And um, the ways in which the book has been turned into literally a precious object, um, uh, embellished with artwork in the most elaborate way, um, in order uh, to uh, show veneration for the scripture that uh, it contains. So here we have a Christian gospel from the seventh century, a Quran from the 14th century, um, and a Jewish Bible from the 13th century. By the way, if, if some of you are saying, no, Jews don't do that in their Bibles, they did sometimes. <laughs> and this just barely started in the 13th century. This is one of the earliest examples with, with uh, illuminations in it. Um, all right, so those are the three dimensions. And I'm suggesting that one can begin to think about the, way, the ways in which, in similar ways and different ways, different communities, different traditions have ritualized their books um, in these ways. I want to suggest to you, maybe more provocatively though, that each of these three traditions tends to have a different kind of effect within the community and beyond it. The semantic dimension, the dimension of interpretation, I think tends to go towards building and reinforcing the authority of the tradition and the authority of the interpreters who speak for that tradition. I already suggested to you that the um, semantic dimension, uh, that, that each tradition emphasizes scholarship and that scholars tend to play a big role in leadership. Um, so this is an amplification of that. When we argue about the authority of scripture and what that means, we're generally talking about the authority of the meaning of the words, right? How do they apply? How do they govern our lives? And the people who wield that authority, here I have a picture of a Christian preacher with his Bible. It could be an imam, it could be a rabbi. But the people who wield that authority, for them, the scriptures become the way of justifying and, um, and elaborating it. 
I, I, would, I would suggest, too, that I think it's typical in all three traditions, not universal, but typical, that when there's conflict within the community or within the tradition, it tends to, the, the semantic dimension of the scripture is the place where that conflict should be adjudicated. That is, it becomes an argument between the interpreters. Is this the correct interpretation, or is that the correct interpretation of the text? In a way that is analogous to the way secular law functions, especially in this country where the Constitution of the U.S. becomes the ultimate arbiter for a conflict if it makes its way all the way to the Supreme Court. So in each tradition, the semantic dimension tends to serve as that form of arbitration. I think the performative dimension has a different kind of effect. I think it serves to inspire. Now, by inspiration here, I'm not talking about beliefs in the inspiration of the text, that is God's inspiration uh, or giving of the text. I'm talking rather about the effects of uh, the inspiring effects of the text on believers and followers in the tradition. Here I've got two examples from Jewish tradition, a choir of cantors singing in a synagogue, um, a famous scene from the movie of the Ten Commandments. For many people, I think, when you speak to them about the way in which the scripture has affected their lives, has changed their lives, has made them a new person, what they will often refer back to is, um, is a performance. The sounds of the words, the experience of hearing them in a particular place, the experience of, um, of encountering them in a particular performative form. The um, iconic dimension, I think, is you, the ritualization of it serves to legitimize the tradition and to legitimize those who can manipulate or hold the book. The most obvious examples are political. Um, the ways in which sacred texts are used by politicians around the world um, in taking their oaths of office, whether it's an American president laying his hand on the Bible or an Indonesian president taking his oath with the Quran held over his head. The, sa the sacred texts here are used in order to try to gain some of their legitimacy to the office holder who is taking form. And, and this can be multiplied uh, many times. But I, but I think the, the effect of legitimacy in terms of the iconic dimension is broader than that. Um, the ways in which one handles one's sacred text, the ways in which one displays it, decorates it, are ways of, as it were, showing the value of the tradition um, itself. I think the fact that it's this iconic dimension, the dimension that has to do with the physical artifact itself that, that um, is used to enhance legitimacy, may begin to explain why the threat or the actual carrying out of an act of desecration of the object can cause such huge ramifications. The thing about the iconic dimension is anybody who can get their hands on the thing can manipulate it. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't even have to know how to read the language. All you have to do is have it in your hands. And that is great power to people who want to venerate the scripture but don't have the education to do it. Nevertheless, they can treat it reverently. They can, and in that way, show their honor of God. It also means that those who wish to attack a tradition can um, desecrate it and in so doing um, try to attack the legitimacy of that tradition. And of course we all know we've had um, quite a bit of uh, headlines about such acts recently. Um, but, but I think that's part of what is going on and that's part of why it touches such a sensitive nerve because there's a, there's a stake of legitimacy that's been invested in this. Now, I don't want to be too hard and fast about my three divisions. I mean, obviously, this all runs together. It's not that one division can't be more uh, inspiring and the like. But, but I do think there's a, um, that the three different kinds of effects from ritualizing these different dimensions reinforce each other. For example, as I said, the semantic dimension is the place where you expect conflicts to be adjudicated. In all three of these traditions, the fact that people, in fact the experts, argue over the meaning of the text 
it seems like all the time, has virtually become canonized within the tradition itself. Um, in fact, it's basically where people expect the experts to argue <laughs> is over, over what it means. Um, in the last 200 years in Europe and then in America, in the study of the Bible, that argument has spilled into major historical investigations that have, in many people's minds, undermined the credibility of the text itself. It's not as old as it looks. It's not written by who Jews and Christians always said it was written by, et cetera, those kinds of arguments. And, and this has been going on now a long time. However, that has left many observers mystified as to why is it that Jewish and Christian scriptures still have such status? I mean, why after 200 years of historical scholarship do they seem to still wield as much religious influence as ever before? I would suggest to you one possible answer is here. First of all, the traditions expect people to argue over the semantic meaning of the scripture. That's actually not new. Secondly, as long as the performative and the iconic dimensions remain highly ritualized, and they do in, um, in Christian and Jewish cultures, it insulates the scripture from suffering too much damage um, from these kinds of arguments. In fact, I, I think the fact that the Bible is argued over so often and so publicly and so widely tends to just serve the purpose of saying, wow, this must be really important. <laughs> <laughs> that is, the debate, in effect, has the uh, has effect of, of adding to the ritualized um, uh, semantic interpretation. Okay. So far, what I have talked about have tended to be the social effects of ritualizations of scripture. However, we all know that scriptures are not just um, books that are ritualized within communities, within congregations, within houses of worship. They are also venerated by individuals personally. I want to suggest to you here right at the end that these three dimensions can be applied to personal veneration of the scriptures as well. Again, in the semantic interpretive dimension, um, individuals are encouraged to study the scriptures for themselves at least in Jewish and Muslim cultures, to learn the languages of the scripture for themselves. One of, by the way, for the Christians in the room, one of the ways that we're really odd among world religions is that we pay virtually no attention to the original languages of our scripture. I have yet to account for that, but it's, Buddhists come the closest for being a translational, the Mahayana Buddhist tradition for being translation. But, but Christians have been avid translators from the very beginning, and it, it really does stand out as a rather unusual difference. Most scriptural traditions put a lot of emphasis on learning those languages and using them in worship and the like. So, but, but even in Christian tradition, the studying the text, at least in translation, learning it, incorporating it, plays, um, is, is, is an ideal that is espoused for individuals, and very many people do, in fact, give a great deal of attention to it. Um, in some Christian communities, uh, Bibles bear the physical marks of such study. Um, I, I, I show you this picture because um, for some other Christians, and for very many people from other traditions, uh, looking at this and saying that's a Bible, they say, gee, that's been desecrated. Look what they've done to that. But actually, within um, Christian communities in which this is done, this is precisely the reverse. This is an act of veneration to have done this. And it illustrates the point that with, with any ritual, you always have to know what the intent was behind it. After all, um, we've been hearing a lot about the burning or threatening to burn Qurans. However, I've been told by uh, devout Muslims that the proper way, or at least one proper way, to dispose of a worn out Quran is to burn it or bury it. Right? So, so it's, it's not the action, it's the intent, right? In this case, again, we have a, uh, an example. The intent here is to, um, is to engage in very close semantic study of the text. 
Of course, the fact that individuals do this on their own um, often leads to some interesting conclusions that the um, leaders of the various religious communities are not so happy with. Um, I, I, the, the one example I've got here is a Hebrew text of Torah in which somebody has um, analyzed it according to a skip jump code, um, finding various Hebrew words by skipping, you know, 15 letters or so. Um, some of you will remember that. Um, I think it was in the 1990s, uh, a book called The Bible Code was on the New York Times bestseller list for weeks and weeks and weeks using exactly this method. Um, as far as I know, not something that I know of any religious authorities who would endorse that kind of interpretation. So you, you put the book into people's hands and who knows what they end up doing with it. Um, and, and these things can sometimes go in unconventional directions. In terms of the performative dimension, um, again, um, and, and this slides into the semantic very closely, individuals are encouraged and, um, uh, to read the scriptures for themselves, to often to memorize verses, if they can, memorize whole sections, the entire thing. Um, and, and such a, an incorporation of the scriptures into one's own person, uh, into one's own mind, play a major role, I think, in how very many people um, incorporate and live out the scriptures for themselves. It's the scriptures not so much on the page, but the scriptures that are in the mind, that are on the lips and the tongue that, um, that motivate. Uh, um, the publishing industry um, is happy to accommodate this um, emphasis uh, by the religious traditions, by encouraging um, the reading of scriptures in as many different forms as possible. Um, I may be wrong about this, correct me if I'm wrong, but again, I think the Christian publishing industry is in the lead on this one in terms of producing Bibles in absolutely more different forms than one can possibly imagine, including several comic books there. Um, but but I, I will say that, um, that um, Muslim publishers, Jewish publishers are not that far behind on this either. It, it, it's, it's, though it's, it, it comes out in different ways in the different traditions, the, um, there's a market out there for scriptures, for aids to help in learning the scriptures and in reading them. In the iconic dimension, the um, scriptures become ritualized by individuals um, in terms of their display. A very traditional example is on the left, a mezuzah. Um, traditional in Jewish homes for at least 2,000 years. They were found among the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, the, uh, uh, which is a very small box, as you see in this case, in the shape of a Torah scroll, but which contains a scrap of parchment with the hand-lettered uh, uh, verses from, um, from the Torah. On the right, a Quran is displayed on, a, in a, on the wall of a home and also a hanging with, I believe, Quranic verses on it, not an uncommon way of venerating the scriptures visually uh, within, within a Muslim home. Um, people also wear scriptures about their persons, either, either um, things that look like scriptures, like medallions, and um, you can buy Again, you can buy things like this locket for any conceivable religious tradition in the shape of a book with a mark to tell you which tradition you're, uh, you're, you're uh, dealing with. But this is not a modern innovation. Um, in all three traditions, scriptures have been carried um, as amulets or talismans for a very long time. Uh, the image in the center right is a Quran. It's a complete Quran. The pages are only two inches um, wide. It has, was written by hand in the 16th century and had its own box where one could wear it uh, on one's person. Of course, these days, the entire scriptures are readily available, so it's easier just to carry around the thing itself. Um, and what makes these images recognizable is to realize that yes, people are carrying and using their scriptures, but they're also visibly carrying them. And, and so the image of someone carrying a Bible or carrying a Quran has become a, a, a not infrequent image with its own connotations and, and uh, implications within our media culture. 
And here I have to bring back our, um, our marked up Bible, because even though it certainly does reflect the studiousness of the person who owned it, I have to also admit that in uh, certain Christian cultures, this is also a status symbol. Uh, it shows your piety, it shows your reflection, the fact, and to the point that you can see signs around the country that say things like, um, uh, oh, I can't quote it now, um, a good, a, a Christian, who isn't falling apart is one. Now, a Christian who has a Bible that is, that is falling apart is one that isn't. Uh, that they're not falling apart, right? The, uh, I'm, I'm not getting the quote right, but it's become it's become a mark of, of one's um, of one's attainment. Okay, so my thesis tonight is simply this: that in the ways in which people use their scriptures in each of these three traditions and in many others are, are wildly diverse and different, but they can be charted more or less in three different directions with different implications. And I think the overall implication of ritualizing scriptures in these three ways is that doing so generates and then also protects religious identity, the identity of the individual um, as a Muslim, as a Christian, as a Jew, um, the identity of the community, um, even the identity of larger, um, of larger uh, communities, um, sometimes nations, and so on. It's gotten to the point, I think, where these days, especially on the internet, the stereotypical look of the scriptures of each of these three traditions is as recognizable and tends to represent the tradition just as often as do those symbols that we usually put on our posters, you know, a crescent, a cross, a star of David. Um, th these images work just as well nowadays, and it's a way in which the visual depiction of the scripture stands in for the uh, religion and its followers. Thank you very much for having me tonight. I appreciate your attention here on a Thursday evening, and I very much recommend to you the series that follows, which I'm delighted to say um, follows my three dimensions here very nicely, art, interpretation, performance, and I hope in the discussions you have over the next year, you'll be able to show each other all the places where I was wrong and where this needs to be more fully nuanced and where more detail needs to be added to all this. So thank you for having me this evening. So I would like to encourage um, questions now, please. And for me, this is um, the part where the conversation gets very exciting. And I'm going to put my professor hat on and urge the students to stay as long as you can, because um, this is the fun part, I think. Please um, come down to the microphones for anyone who has a question. And uh, please, if you can, make it a question as much as you can. Thank you so much. I also welcome rebuttals. <laughs> Beautiful presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, there is something which is really I uh, like to mention here. It is in the Quran. There is uh, something which stand out among the three, which is you mentioned. Everybody's going to say mine. It's look beautiful. No, I'm the others. I'm, I'm not saying that. But the point is, it seems like in the Quran actually it's. It's, it's the to really prove and authorize the two scriptures, I mean the Bible and the Torah, and, and, and more differ than the others in a way where it is, has not been changed yeah. for, since it's delivered. So the point of the question I'm trying to ask, does this one actually give it more weight where it's basically come to support the two books, which is the Bible and the Torah. And the third battle, again, is those who really, they don't believe these exist or never exist, for example. Um, now, let, let me just ask, are, when, um, are you referring to debates over the historical origins of the Torah and the Bible that I refer to in historical criticism? Not the criticism, really. It's that the, the, there is there is a really a movement which has been all along. It is these are the creation, for example, of Jesus himself, or the creation of Musa, of Moses himself. Yes. It's really it, it is it is these sub, slept or so dreams, 
or they woke up and they said, guess what, this is from God. Uh, the point I'm trying to say, it, it's the validity and reliability of the books itself, the Quran. It really validates the existence, the true existence of the Torah and the true existence of, of the Bible. Uh, the, the Quran validates exactly. the existence exactly. of the, yes. Um, thank you. Um, that is um, a tradition, I don't know if it's in the Quran itself, it's certainly very soon in, in Muslim um, tradition to see the Quran as the completion, culmination, and correction of the preceding uh, scriptures and the work of the preceding prophets. Uh, uh, maybe for those of you who don't know, in the in the Quran, uh, the prophets um, Abraham, Moses, um, Jesus, Mary. Mary gets more press in the Quran than in the Christian Bible, by the way. Just just thought. <laughs> but um, um, all of these are affirmed as prophets of God, legitimate prophets of God, um, whose uh, and correct me if I get this wrong, but whose revelations have been now perfected and completed in the, in the revelations given to the Prophet Muhammad. Is, am I giving this correctly? Yes, okay. Um, I, I wanna add a little bit to that and, and then, then make a comment. Um, one of the, and, and again, please, those of you who know this better than I do, correct me, one of the interesting features for historians like me in um, early Muslim tradition is the effort by Muslim scholars early on to validate the Quran and especially the sayings of the Hadith um, and by what we would recognize today as, as historical principles. That is, who said this to who? What's the source of the transmission? How far back can we trace it? Is this a reliable source or not? You know, do we really believe this guy? <laughs> you know, these, these kinds of questions are, 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 are in the, um, uh, are being uh, asked by Muslim scholars of the Quran and especially the Hadith in the, I think, within 100, 200 years of the revelation of Muhammad and become part of the way in which this, uh, the hadith especially is established. There's some hadiths, I, I believe, that people really don't trust. They, they're not, sh uh, we don't really trust. <laughs> yeah, they say Muhammad did that, but that, that is, the guy's a liar. <laughs> there, there are others who come from genuine companions and so on, right? So, so there's this kind of discriminating judgment. Now, it was observed roughly the same time. Here we're talking the high Middle Ages, so on the Christian calendar, 1,000, 11, 1,200 CE. Um, it was also observed uh, by Muslims that Christians and Jews have a much harder time doing this with their scriptures, right? Trying to trace out. The, for those of you who don't know, the oldest manuscripts we have of the, um, of the Hebrew scriptures are now the Dead Sea Scrolls, dating at the earliest from three to two to 100 BCE. Um, for the Christian Bible, we have a few fragments from the second century, but basically we depend on fourth century. So, so there's several centuries in there, and, and it's not, we, we, we don't have this tradition of so-and-so told so-and-so told so-and-so. Not always, in, so, in some cases there, there's a tradition. Actually, the rabbis have a tradition, don't they? From Ezra down through all the rabbis uh, to the Talmud. Um, and there's something similar among the apostles. But, but it's, it's, it's a longer period of time, it's more difficult and, and the like. This actually set off a huge scholarly war, if you will, among scholars, arguments among the three traditions in the high Middle Ages where each scholars in each tradition um, worked hard to historically back up their own traditions while undermining the, um, the historical claims of the other traditions. We think it's modern historians who do this, but the medievals were already in there at this, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, all of them, though very much against each other's scriptures, right? Um, I, I recount that history because, um, because it's, um, it, it shows actually the way in which the traditions influenced each other, that as I do think, from Muslim scholarship came an attention to his history and historical um, evaluation of the data, which had not been part of Christian and I think Jewish tradition prior to that time. Um, and eventually it developed into um, uh, modern historical criticism after, after many changes. Um, 
I, I, you should know, though, that, that generally Jews and Christians have not accepted the idea there then that the Quran corrects and completes their own scriptures. Right? Uh, they, that, that's the point. Say, no, the scriptures are correct and complete as we have them. And where there are differences in the story, uh, for example, famously the story of um, Abraham and his son, right? Which son is it and how, how did that go, right? This difference, each tradition will certainly stand on its own version of that story, right? And that's where the disagreements then start and develop. I don't know if I answered your question, but I danced around it long enough. <laughs> Hi, thank you for being here. I'm just curious, in the Jewish tradition, as far as the public recitation of the sacred text, um, there's certain requirements that there's a minion. Yes. And I'm wondering if that's similar in any other tradition that you've spoken of here or in other traditions that you haven't spoken of. Um, I don't know, actually. Um, I don't believe there's a similar thing to the minion, the, the, the ten uh, needed for prayer. Is that also for reading the text aloud? You can read it privately, right? Um, so the minion has to do with a prayer group, and I cannot think of an example in Christian, and I don't know of one in Muslim tradition, that sets... I mean, often prayer is, is, prayer can be solitary in all three. So I, I don't know of a parallel to that. Yes? The question for those of you who couldn't hear had to do with idolatry. Is there a point at which veneration of the text becomes idolatry? And where is that line? Um, oh, good question. <laughs> As a student of comparative scriptures, I cannot address that question. That is a question for each person to address within their own tradition and within their own um, materials. Um, what I'll say about it is this. I think the fear of idolatry has led scholars like me to ignore the iconic dimension or simply to laugh at it and then ignore it. We haven't paid it any attention. It's one of the reasons I've been running the project that, um, that Professor Carter Bozen referred to is exactly the fact that there hasn't been much done on this. I mean, on the interpretation of the semantic dimension, there are volumes and volumes and libraries full of volumes, but on the iconic dimension, there is very, very little. Um, and so I thought it was high time to study it without making a normative judgment about it. Um, the iconic dimension, especially in, uh, as practiced by individuals, I, I can say it, it's, it's an element that is hard for the um, religious authorities and various traditions to control. I mean, this is obviously the case if someone wants to burn a Quran, you know, they, they, it, it's hard to stop them. But, but I'm thinking of other much more common things. For example, my colleague, Ann Gold, who is an ethnographer in India, pointed out to me that very many people in the villages she works in have um, uh, Quranic verses inscribed on amulets that they carry around with them because they're considered objects of power. Now, the, the interesting thing here is not the fact that, of course, they can't read Arabic, so it's just an object to them. It's the fact that they're not Muslims. <laughs> That is, the, the, the Quranic verse is seen as an object of power, even by people who are not. Um, the New York Times just had an article a week or two ago about the fact that in Manhattan, there are mezuzahs on lots of apartments of which Jews haven't lived for 20 or 40 years. Um, but every successive inheritor of the apartment thinks, oh, that's nice. And some of them have quite a bit of value attached to the thing, though they are, in fact, Christians or spiritualists or whatever. But so, 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 so this iconic dimension sort of um, 
doesn't follow the boundaries <laughs> uh, that we would impose, you know, between religions, between faith systems, and often gets picked up and used. And then, yes, what counts as misuse? Yeah. Yeah, so the, so the question is, is what is the relationship? How does this material object, this, this book that you can hold in your hands, that you can read, how exactly is divinity represented in it? Or how does it mediate it or the like? Um, by the way, I got started on this project by a student who challenged me that I was not paying attention to the material form of the book. Um, and she proceeded to write her dissertation on the iconic book, and she was focused on the Christian scriptures in this way. And um, I, I should add this because it gets to our, our meaning of the word icon. She argued, and I, I came to agree with her, that icon here for her, at least with the Christian Bible, um, is meant um, very specifically in the same sense in which icons function in Eastern Orthodox Christianity. That is, where the, the, the painting is an object that, see, I'm going to get this wrong as soon as I try to say it. It, it mediates divinity in a, in, in a, it's not just a picture representing something else. It is, it participates somehow. Right? And so the icon in an orthodox worship is paraded in. People will kiss it, people will touch it, people will venerate it. And she argues, and the gospel book is exactly the same thing. In fact, they do exactly the same things with them. And in Protestant Christianity, it doesn't have icons. You still have this book, which functions that way. So, um, but as you know, battles over what is iconic and what is a permissible image and not of the deity have been often very difficult, even violent arguments within each of the three Western religious traditions, right? And these boundaries, and so, so here we touch on a sensitive point inside each tradition. And to what extent is the book an exception or not? question, I guess, just to extend that sure. a little bit further. Um, as a Jewish person, I'm very aware of the physical relationship mm -hmm. that Jews have with the book, with mm -hmm. the Torah. Um, we treat it almost like a venerated person. We dress it. We put jewelry and ornaments on it. We carry it. We bury it, you know, when, we're, mm -hmm. when yes. it's damaged. And, and um, I'm wondering if there are some other elements that you could bring out from the other two Abrahamic traditions where that kind of physical relationship of, of kissing or you know, things that, in terms of ways in which you need to protect the mm -hmm. physical item from, from damage, um, or if that's something that Jews are particularly comfortable with, or, and you know, I'm just wondering if you could speak a little comparatively about that. Sure. Um, though, before I do, I want to put a big qualification on what I'm about to say, that, that the iconic dimension, like each of the others, can be ritualized in multiple different ways. And what you, I, I like using my little you know, graph symbols, but I'm well aware you can't go you know, mathematically pegging practices as, as more ritualized than others, because some people may not ritualize at all that way and do something completely different or even opposite, which runs to the same effect. Um, let me also say something else while we're still with Jewish tradition. One of the, um, ritualizing a book to a certain extent can sometimes lead to problems. Um, for example, the Torah scroll can become so sacred that you're not allowed to touch it anymore unless you're clean, unless it's in the synagogue, that it, it, can, it can restrict access to the scriptures. Now, Jewish tradition has solved that problem by producing other versions of it, right? The, the Chumash, the, uh, the, the book, 
uh, in book form rather than scroll form, which um, is also sacred, but not nearly as much as a Torah scroll, and which you can keep at home, which, and, and which therefore is, has a different the type, is different, it's, uh, we won't go into the details, but, but it's interesting how in this way the sacred text gets produced in two forms with different levels of sacrality, which sort of engages the problem of what happens when the text gets too sacred and you can't, it's hard to use anymore. Um, uh, in um, uh, many liturgical Christian traditions, um, gospel books are, um, as I say, paraded in. They are kissed. Often after reading the gospel lesson, the priest will kiss the book. Um, it's part of the, um, the ordinary uh, ritual of, of the mass and so on. Um, It's also the case, I was just speaking of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. What I didn't show were the covers of books. I mean, covers can get really elaborate. And, and frequently, the covers are, in fact, images, icons, um, which therefore function as such. Um, in Jewish tradition, it's the mantles, it's the crowns, and so on, which, which become elaborate. Um, in Muslim tradition, I, as far as I know, and again, I'm open, really open to hearing other examples, but my impression is that it's the script that is most readily um, and visibly um, depicted. It's the Arabic um, calligraphy. And I, I, I believe in this series you're having a, a Muslim calligrapher come, so we see this uh, done. And, and, and it's, it's the script almost more than the book form which carries uh, the script and the Arabic letters that carry um, uh, that impression, that vision of the sacred text. Um, though, as I saw, there are monuments to the scriptures, but, but it seems to me, as far as I've been able to tell, that there is not as much a tendency for the book itself to tend to be um, ritualized that far. By the way, though, um, a tradition which is remarkable for the degree to which the book is ritualized in all three dimensions is the Sikh, Sikh tradition, or the Sikh tradition, in which the book is the guru. And in India, is legally the guru to the point of having the legal right to own property and so on in the country. So, um, and, and, and the Guru Granth Sahib is, um, is venerated in all ways as the living guru of the Gurdwara. Yes. Yes. Oh, I've got hundreds of slides of Ten Commandment monuments. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. Okay, the Ten Commandment monuments controversy in this country. I mean, here you have a monumental scripture or part of a scripture that, and a major battle uh, carried on in county courthouses and courts across the country about whether it may, they may appear um, on government property. It's, it's almost invariably, by the way, county courthouses or judicial places, sometimes schools, but, but usually courthouses. Comment. Um, okay, let, let me, what I think is going on here is that, excuse me, in, uniquely in the United States of America, there is another iconic text which is highly venerated and ritualized in both its iconic and its semantic dimension, and that is the U.S. Constitution, to some degree the Declaration of Independence. Um, if you, want to, if you go to the National Archives in Washington and go to the Rotunda where they display them, I, I, I swear, the Jews of the audience, please tell me, doesn't it look like a Torah shrine to you? I mean, <laughs> it just, the whole architecture of the thing, it looks like a Torah shrine, uh, a Torah ark, right? Um, and, um, and this was, in, he used the word enshrined by Harry Truman when that was built in 1950, 51. Um, I would note that something the news media almost never noted, that the famous case for the Ten Commandments monuments was in Alabama, the judicial building, where the, they were brought in and then were, after several months, kicked out. There was a bronze uh, Bill of Rights on the wall the whole time that nobody paid any attention to. I, I have, um, I, I hope this isn't too offensive, but to me, 
this is a battle for which text will, will be iconically supreme um, within the government's temples. Um, and there's a, there's a, there's an rivalry of images going on here. There's an attempt to get um, the, um, to get a image in the courthouse that will legitimate the claim that the United States is a Christian country. And yes, I know, it's always said Christian and Jewish because the Ten Commandments are both. Um, I, I, I think most of this impulse is coming on the Christian side of things, most of it. Um, and, and so, and, and, and it goes back to the iconic dimension of legitimacy, right? Legitimacy of the religion, its relationship to the government, and also perhaps the relative status of two iconic texts. Uh, that, that's very impressionistic, I'm sorry, but at least as an initial idea. I have a question going back to the first question on the Quran being kind of a completion or the fulfillment yes. of the Torah and then the um, Christian Bible and being um, a scholar of those books. Um, is it a possible or a logically possible that the Quran would be the kind of the final say of all that when the Quran says that Jesus was a prophet and the New Testament scriptures are, um, would declare or that he declared to be the son of God and it was for that yeah. very reason that he was crucified? I mean, is that even logically consistent or possible? Um, okay, um, the, the, um, the Muslim tradition of the Quran in particular would deny the claim that Jesus is the son of God. Okay, it would affirm Jesus as a prophet, which is very high status, but it's still human, right? Um, but 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 the the uh, traditions about Jesus in Muslim tradition are as a prophet only. And I guess the question then was: Is it possible to claim that you're the son of God and be a prophet and lie to people and be crucified for that reason and have your disciples? be crucified or, well, I should say murdered for that reason and still hold a prophet status? Um, I, I, I think, I, I think the only way I can answer that question is to move into my hat as a Christian believer, okay? Um, and, and, and so, I mean, I don't think I can answer that at a comparative level, partly because the, the, the valence of the word prophet and the word son of God is gonna mean very different things in the two different traditions. Um, I have had, when I'm teaching my course on the Bible, I have had Muslim students come and ask me insistently about the status of the prophets. And at first I was a bit puzzled, like, well, the prophets and go, but, but it's because Muslim tradition puts a great emphasis on the role of prophet, it's the supreme role, right? In Christian tradition, it's one of a bunch of roles. For, for Christ is not only considered prophet and son of God, but king, messiah, um, and so on, right? There, there's a whole bunch of labels of which sort of the prophet one gets, uh, ends up down the list. And it's, it's hard, it's, it's hard to, there are two different value systems that it's hard to translate one into the other. Am I making any sense? I think so. Um, I think it's exactly at this point where interreligious dialogue gets to be very interesting because um, one of the things as, as you speak, as Christians and Jews and Muslims speak to each other, if you listen carefully, you begin to hear the way in which common words have different, if not meanings, at least different levels of importance within the, the different traditions. So they're, they're, these, these three sibling religions share a great deal of heritage together. But the emphasis falls in different places and then has other, other consequences, right? Thank you. Okay. I wonder if you could say a little something about uh, not only the, the semantic dimension of how the scriptures are interpreted or applied, but the differences both within and among these traditions in terms of understanding the divinity of the word itself. 
So, yes. Um, my impression is that the differences between Jewish, Christian, and Muslim traditions as to the divinity of the word in the scripture pale in comparison to the differences within each one of those traditions of arguments about exactly how that works. <laughs> um, that is, these tend to be the arguments that divide sects and denominations and, and the like and, and can get very complicated. Um, in fact, I'd actually say that about much of what I've talked about here, the differences between the traditions, uh, none of these, I mean, these traditions are so multifaceted, each and of themselves, that, um, that, the, um, uh, that when we're comparing between them, we tend to sort of turn every, uh, there, there's a danger effect of, of reinforcing stereotypes rather than in, in sort of complexifying the, the situation. Um, so the question of um, the inspiration of the scripture, the divinity of the word, how that relates to, to the God, how it relates to the humans who mediate the divinity, all of these become highly um, um, fraught questions. That doesn't mean there isn't a great deal to say about them. I'm just not sure. And, and, and maybe someone else could do it, but I'm just not sure it falls out rather neatly as you know, Muslim ideas, Jewish ideas, Christian ideas, it's, it's much more mixed than that. Now that really is an evading of the question, isn't it? You want to, was there another question here? Okay, sure, please. Um, as for speaking about, um, in the Muslim tradition, uh, you were saying how there isn't as, there isn't as much of an emphasis in the iconic dimension um, except I think you showed how there was a monument of the, um, the Quran. Yeah. And that's actually, that's, I think the reason, that's surprising to me because that's not very typical to see. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, our book is more um, geared toward the, towards the performance and semantic, obviously, as you emphasized. But um, I think it's very uncommon for there to be um, that depiction of it because we do not, as Muslims, we don't usually focus on um, the presenting of the actual book. Like I think, as you were saying, it's more of what is in the text and what that means, and the reading of it um, shows that importance. And it that that's that's a huge thing within our religion. Um, and also, the woman who came up here and who was talking about um, may not exactly reconciling, but talking about um, Jesus as a prophet and son of God within and the differences between the two religions. Um, it's true, as you were saying, how um, there's a large difference of how, how Jesus is considered in um, Muslim tradition and, um, and in Christian tradition, but I think that can be reconciled um, because although there is a difference, um, Muslims, yes, we consider him a prophet, as we consider all the other prophets, um, as Jesus, Moses, Abraham, all of them prophets. But although we don't consider Jesus um, the Son of God, we don't, we don't give him as much. We give him just as much as importance as all the other prophets, even Muhammad. We don't claim divinity of Muhammad. Um, he, we just consider him as the last. Like, as, and the reason for that would be. This is just um, to give a little more information, just in case people don't know. Um, it's just he was the last bringing the message. At, um, as you can see, like um, with Jewish tradition, um, I believe we believe that um, some things may have fallen out, some things may have been changed, um, and then that Christianity came in, and then um, some things may have been changed, and then that's where um, Muhammad came and. He brought, he had the revelation from God. So I don't know, that, I thought that was a, it's something important to just consider and look at. Just there are differences, but that's kind of how they all connect in a certain way. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but I just wanted no, to. No, you make are. A Thank point. you. And, and what I'm actually going to do is, is suggest that the two of you talk. <laughs> uh, especially on the, I, I, would, I would like to say um, on the first point, I think. It is the case that um, 
I'm trying to find a neutral, non-judgmental word to use, and I'm having trouble, so I'll just say it this way. I think informed believers, participants in any of these three traditions, and especially their leaders, will all say exactly what you said. What's important is what the words mean, and that one, follow them. That is, that's absolutely orthodox doctrine in each of these traditions. Okay. And that's why I think the iconic dimension has generally been ignored, and why it is often downplayed. Um, and I am not by any means suggesting there's anything wrong with that orthodox tradition. All I'm pointing out is there's a heck of a lot of iconic stuff going on. And it comes as a surprise to Jews and Christians as well as Muslims to point out some of these things. Um, and and it, it, they pose a bit of a problem as we had the discussion about idolatry. I mean, it raises that problem. And I think that is a common problem of the three traditions. I'm uh, going to be a little more blasphemous and talk about sacred texts. We're here to talk about sacred texts. I have uh, in front of me here a device that, <laughs> that gives me blessings for whatever I'd like to individualize my experience in the sacred texts. What I'd like you to do, if you would be willing, is uh, to think about fast forward in the future, mm -hmm. past the printing press, et cetera, mm -hmm. where we have more access. Where do you see uh, these sacred texts as we go into the future and have access to all the traditions that we'd like to have in our palm of our hand? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, the problem of ebooks and electronic texts. Uh, Mark Taylor is going to have a lot to say about this, so come back in April. Um, I have been following the debate over ebooks and their effects um, with great interest, um, and have been int and, and, and what I have noticed is this: as far as I can tell, religious publishers of these three traditions and many others got into e-publishing and e-books faster and more profitably earlier than any secular publishers ever did. They were doing it in the 90s when all the secular people were losing their losing fortunes at it. The religious publishers were putting out Bibles in 1500 translations. They were putting out original texts. They were putting out commentaries. They were putting out Qurans. I love, by the way, the, 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 the website that has the three different English translations of the Quran side by side. So you can, you know, that's a wonderful thing. <laughs> you can do it. I mean, I mean, eat. And what amused me is I have yet to hear any religious leader or community complain about them. Now, there's certain issues of what if the word of God gets, you know, if, if, the, if the name of God, gets, if, the, if the name of God gets printed out and, you know, and it gets desecrated, what, you know, what should you, do? or, you know, is it really appropriate to have Quranic ringtones on your phone? I mean, yeah, but these are on the margins, right? I mean, the main thing of computerized text, religious groups love this stuff. It's English professors who don't like it. <laughs> it's fans of Emily Dickinson and Shakespeare. They're the ones who are talking about, oh, you have to have the book in your hands, you have to feel it, you have to smell it, da 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 And I've been listening, I think, now this is really interesting. Why is that? Okay, so here's my thesis. I may well be wrong. I try never to predict the future, but they say never say never. I think the reason religious traditions don't, aren't threatened by e-text is they don't think anybody's ever going to parade an iPod at Simchat Torah. No one's going to kiss an iPod while walking into Canterbury Cathedral. No one's going to wave one in a protest in Palestine, right? Not going to happen. Not now, not ever. At least that's the attitude. And therefore there's no threat. The English professors think maybe someday no one will read Emily Dickinson except online, and that's a threat, right? So, so um, it's interesting. Often, we often think of religious groups as, as tending to be um, technologically conservative and backwards, but at least when it comes to communications technology, that is demonstrably untrue. 
It has often been religious groups of all kinds who have been the first and the fastest to get there and to use the new technology. And that's certainly happening with e-tech. Now, one other comment. Uh, one of my um, uh, collaborators on the Iconic Books Project is a Korean scholar who works in Seoul, and he catches all sorts of examples of iconic texts for me from Korean culture. Um, in Buddhist tradition, um, sutras are recited for blessings. And you may know that you can, there are mechanical means for doing this. You can put a sutra inside a prayer wheel. You spin the wheel, and it's the effect, the same effect as saying the blessing. Well, some enterprising individuals thought, well, gee, if we download the sutra to our hard drive, that spins at, what, 1,500 times a second. Think how many blessings you can. And I mean, this is, and people do this. Now, you laugh, but what has struck me is it's interesting that the virtual text ceases being virtual as soon as it's ritualized, right? The interest is now on the physical object, in this case, a hard drive. How fast does it spin, right? Virtual texts don't exist. They're either oral, memorized, or they're written on some physical medium. And, um, that, and as soon as the medium, as soon as one starts ritualizing it iconically, it's the medium that's ritualized. So maybe someday someone will dance with an iPod, I don't know, you know, at a Simchat Torah. But when they do, they're going to start paying real close attention to Apple's design. <laughs> In a way, they don't right now. <laughs> one, last one. Um, uh, the question was of the relative size of the scriptures of the three traditions. Um, the Quran is roughly, in terms of number of words, uh, the size of the Christian New Testament. Okay, which, and, and I'm sorry, I don't have the numbers here, but if you, if you think about it that way, the New Testament, if you take a standard Protestant Bible, is only about one quarter of the total. The, um, the Tanakh or Hebrew Bible is uh, three times that size, roughly. And if we're talking Catholic Old Testament, then it's even bigger. So, so the um, Jewish, so of the three traditions, the Quran is the smallest scripture, the, the Christian the largest, and the Jewish about three quarters or so of the Christian. Thank you all very much. You've been a wonderful uh, group to talk to this evening.